Join me this week on One on One when I sit down with Police Chief Noel Catney. He's been working in this community for more than 30 years and he says he's got the best job in the whole world. I'll find out why. Peel Regional Police Chief Noel Catney leads the third largest municipal police service in Canada. He oversees a staff of close to 2,000 members, and together with his team, he looks after the safety of almost a million residents. The chief has been with the Peel Regional Police Force since its inception in 1974. Chief, when you were growing up, did you ever dream of being in a position like this? Actually, no. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, um, I've always felt that I was blessed or very fortunate because many of my friends and uh, uh, relatives and other people that I know were unsure of what they were going to do with their life uh, as we moved through the educational system and as we matured. And I always knew from the age of 15 that uh, I didn't just want to be a police officer. I wanted to be a homicide officer because I always had a very keen interest in homicide investigation and forensic investigation and used to read as much as I poss possibly could about that during my teenage and adolescent years and uh, so that's what I aspired to be and uh, always thought that I was very fortunate when I finally was asked to go into homicide uh, with the Peel Regional Police in uh, 1975, July 30th of 1975 and really thought I had plateaued at that point. So I never really considered uh, not just a chief's position, I never considered a senior position really, to be honest with you. And when, while you were growing up, were there a lot of homicides in the community you lived in? Did you live in a big town, a small town? Actually, I lived in the west end of Toronto. Um, 12 Division was the area that served my area and uh, was very active in sports. I always played a lot of sports, hockey, baseball, soccer, and had interacted with many uh, police officers. Uh, they were tremendous, uh, the Toronto police officers at the time were tremendous uh, people and very, very much involved in coaching and refereeing and many aspects of sports. And uh, plus I followed several uh, regular TV shows and uh, read a lot of detective books and detective novel novels and that sort of thing. So it was just really a, an overall interest in policing and specifically uh, homicide. So did you want to help people? Did you have that urge or did you want to solve crimes? A bit of both. I've always um, been raised by, by my parents and by my family and uh, to, to care about people and to uh, uh, be protective of people and be sensitive to their privileges, their rights and uh, would certainly uh, never stand by at any point in my life if I thought that uh, person's rights uh, were being violated or they were in any danger or their security was being compromised, I'd always be willing to uh, assist if I could. Uh, so uh, that was part of it and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I've always had a, a fascination with the investigation of, of uh, homicides and how they're resolved and uh, it just seemed to me to be something that uh, would be very challenging and very rewarding because um, Human life, to me, sanctity of life is a term that I sometimes use when I'm speaking in our community or to my staff. And uh, you know, the sanctity of life is so important. And uh, I've certainly noticed over the years, uh, now that I'm into my 33rd year of policing, that uh, the value and the respect that we placed on life, unfortunately, I think worldwide, has seemed to diminish a little bit. And I'd, I'd like to see us return to where it once was, where people cherished uh, life itself. So you have the morality unit, then to the homicide unit. You probably witnessed quite a bit. Did you find that difficult at times? Did you ever go home and you couldn't get those images out of your mind or question the motives of some of the people you may have been saving other people from? Yeah, certainly. Um, some of the more serious crimes, some of the multiple situations I've been involved in the investigation of uh, double homicides and triple homicides and uh, some of the more uh, difficult situations were, uh, were uh, 
uh, young women were violated, uh, abducted and violated and uh, murdered, and uh, some of the uh, young children that were unfortunately victims in some of the homicide matters I dealt with certainly are a little bit more difficult to deal with, but there's an immense amount of training and preparation and selection. It's, it's quite an involved process before one is selected for that area and uh, more than prepares you to deal uh, for the most part with what you're confronted with. But uh, certainly there were a couple of isolated uh, situations that uh, were somewhat a bit more difficult to handle than, than, the, than the standard uh, matter that you would get involved in. But uh, it was very, very enjoyable. I enjoyed uh, not just every moment, every second of it. And uh, when you get into some of the more complex and difficult cases where they're multi-jurisdictional and uh, perhaps uh, the, the suspect uh, in some of the cases that I had uh, is targeting uh, young women or those that are more perhaps more vulnerable and uh, the investigations at times can last for several years not just months and to conclude those investigations successfully is a very unique uh, feeling and to be able to finally bring that information to the families and uh, that have survived and, and they, they can have closure on the matter and to do it, conclude the case in a very professional fashion so that uh, you reflect well, hopefully not only on yourself and your organization, but uh, on the community and process the matter through court successfully. It's, uh, it's a very rewarding experience. Let's talk about your work at the Intelligence Bureau. That sounds like a neat job. Yes, it was, yeah. I went uh, to intelligence uh, I was asked to take over the branch in December 20th of 1981 and uh, was deployed there till April 19th, 1987. And that was a very, very interesting uh, dichotomy from homicide. It was much different uh, type of policing, but uh, very fascinating. And of course, uh, uh, yes, a lot of undercover um, issues there and uh, working basically provincially and sometimes outside the province. and sometimes in the United States, depending on what the issue was. And during that period, uh, here in Peel Region, we're becoming more and more exposed to global and international crime. Uh, we were seeing that our citizens and our businesses were uh, on an escalating basis, being victimized by international rings uh, in terms of very highly structured uh, after the break, we'll be right back with more from Police Chief Noel Catney. In 1937, in October of 1937, Streetsville became the focus of national, uh, even to some extent international, attention for a crime, a gruesome crime, as it was described. Perpetrators or people pretending to be the perpetrators were leaving ransom notes, uh, were leaving threatening letters, referring to themselves as the Streetsville Ghouls. And this became the name by which these perpetrators had been known to this day, the Streetsville Ghouls. They were never caught, by the way. This is an old, unsolved crime uh, in Streetsville. You're at community functions all the time. I know I try to be at some. Yes. Representing Rogers. How do you possibly make the time? I imagine yeah. you're at one every single evening. Um, sometimes, just about recently, I've had a very high, heavy schedule. Um, it's just very important. Um, last year in 2001, I believe I had uh, 156 uh, commitments. Uh, the vast majority of those commitments would be nights or weekends. But, you know, when we, when we have such a uh, uh, um, region that's just really expanding at the level it is and there's a tremendous amount of vitality and development and growth and now reaching the stage where we have 116 cultures, uh, 
I believe that the, someone who occupies the position of chief of police is really mitigated and mandated to be out personally and to talk to the citizens and to hear what they have to say and uh, really it's uh, in terms of checks and balances it's really a wonderful way to assure myself that we and, and the other members of my team, the management team that uh, run the organization are indeed doing the right thing and going in the right direction because there's, there's no better barometer to me than uh, the seniors and, and the men and women uh, and uh, young adults who live and work in the region and the children in fact too. I get involved uh, a great deal with the children of our region and just really taking in what they say and comparing it against where I'm going and what I'm the direction I'm taking the organization and it, it just helps give me peace of mind that I'm doing the right thing. I guess there's no such thing as nine to five for you. Uh, rarely. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, one that um, uh, wants to uh, aspire to this level and, uh, and seek and gain this level uh, really um, shouldn't be too concerned about their watch or their clock or certainly if they want a nine to five job, uh, trust me, uh, this isn't it. No. I imagine your family must be very supportive. Yes, uh, absolutely. I've been very blessed with, uh, with my wife. Uh, she's been my closest friend, really, and uh, has been tremendously supportive of me and, uh, and everything I've done in my career and my family. And uh, um, they make a tremendous sacrifice as well to allow me to do the things I do. So I'm very, very uh, eternally grateful for that and thankful. And maybe your wife makes you breakfast. We've got to know what she's putting in your cornflakes <laughs> to keep you going all day. Well, you t you, uh, probably breakfast, as I'm sure your nutritionist, your doctor, or your parents have told you. Um, clearly to me, uh, it's the most important meal of the day, and uh, you really do need to have a good breakfast, and I try to do that every morning. And uh, you have to try and uh, maintain a, a good diet and uh, maintain that balance of... of deployment with your duties and also the break away from it and uh, the outside interests uh, are uh, to me um, a wonderful way to uh, to break some of the uh, more difficult challenges that you get break away from it and uh, have that time to reflect and enjoy yourself and uh, act socially or whether it's recreational endeavors or so you always have to have that time as well to uh, to maintain the balance. I do a lot of uh, walking, I do a lot of cycling, uh, I like playing golf, uh, I love gardening, uh, I like getting out of the city and uh, going up north. Uh, recently have, uh, years ago I used to do a lot of fishing, uh, I enjoy that. I enjoy being out on the water and uh, I like boating. So recently I have uh, tried to make more time for that as well. So. The break from it is, is wonderful uh, to get away, and uh, I think you come back refreshed, revitalized. So you allow yourself a vacation every now and again? Yes, yes, absolutely. That's good to hear. <laughs> That's important. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about how policing has changed in our community post 9-11, and are you sensitive to new issues? How do you cope? Yes, clearly um, it's changed dramatically uh, in the Western Hemisphere, period. And certainly for uh, those of us here in Peel, it has changed and uh, changed dramatically the airport. You know, as you know, we have 27 million plus people a year that travel through the airport. And that doesn't include relatives, uh, literally thousands, hundreds of thousands of relatives that would have, and friends that would attend at the airport to pick people up off flights. Mm -hmm. We also have over 20,000 people a day that go to the airport for employment purposes. It's, it's bigger than most of the, larger than most of the smaller towns in the province of Ontario. So it's really a unique, it's an anomaly, it's, it's, it's a unique uh, situation there. It's a, it's a uh, community within a community, if you will. It, and you're in charge of the team looking after the airport as well. Yes, yes, I have a, a superintendent and an inspector that uh, administrate my staff at the airport. Uh, we have uh, uh, well over 100 staff at the airport. and. Uh, since uh, the incidents of last uh, September 11th, of course, we've had to devote uh, a tremendous amount of resources there in terms of uh, security issues and investigative issues. And uh, so it's, it's placed a great demand on the organization to protect our community and protect those that are coming through the airport. And uh, there's been a change in the uh, number of airlines that access the airport, and that will continue. 
um, over the coming months and years. In October of 2003, it's expected that the new terminal uh, will open, and very soon into the future, uh, we're going to uh, be seized with the challenge of providing security and protection for over 55 million passengers a year from 27 million. So uh, our responsibilities will uh, almost double, if not more. Is terrorism so, a fear in your mind? It's always something that we have to be cognizant of, and certainly um, we found a, a tremendous enhancement of the, the good graces of our police services board and the acting chairman, Jim Murray, and, uh, and the members and the regional council uh, in the budget for 2002 were kind enough to uh, comply with my request, and I added 15 additional officers to our intelligence branch, uh, which is a significant uh, economic impact. Uh, but that has allowed us to play a role in provincial joint forces operations, intelligence operations, to uh, so that we're uh, in the eye of the storm, if you will. We're in the center. We're right there at the uh, at the uh, the main points. Uh, we're involved in major probes, not only provincially, nationally, but internationally, and have since uh, since that very day uh, been closely working with the. Uh, CIA and the FBI and uh, CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, and all of the major uh, organizations concerned with monitoring terrorist activities and individuals believed to be associated with them. And uh, um, without question, uh, we were able to very quickly substantiate the fact that uh, there's a clear and convincing uh, presence of Al Qaeda or Al-Qaeda, whatever you're comfortable with, pronunciation, uh, connections both here in Mississauga and in Brampton. So uh, it's certainly been a learning experience for us and uh, we, uh, we now are in a position where I'm very, very comfortable uh, for our citizens in terms of their safety and their security and I realize that's largely my responsibility and uh, that of my staff. Uh, so I'm very comfortable that we have the appropriate number of people the uh, right people for the job and that we're networking and liaising and uh, with uh, all of the agencies that we need to uh, essentially worldwide to uh, maintain the quality of life that, uh, that we want here in this region and uh, in our two beautiful cities of Mississauga and Brampton. So you said there there was some information linking Al-Qaeda to this community? That's correct, yeah. yes. And yes, verified information to Mississauga and Brampton. Really? Yes. And so are they still operating here under watch, I suppose, or you maybe can't talk No, about they're that. not operating here anymore. Uh, that's as far as I could go. <laughs> we have addressed that issue. Now, has it been difficult to address these sort of issues? I know um, you've always been one to promote diversity within the community, but 9-11 has stirred up some different points as well, and do you find those conflicting at times? Yeah, so one of the... Uh, in retrospect, I, and I'm very pleased I did that, uh, we enjoy here, as you know, um, a wonderful relationship with the leaders of all of our communities. And um, I was concerned when the incident occurred, the incidents occurred, and what we immediately put into place was uh, the next day, I believe it was, September 12th, I generated a press release to all of our citizens. We convened a press conference here at police headquarters. I invited the leaders of all of our diverse communities to that conference and hopefully uh, articulated in a very clear and uh, precise fashion, uh, appealing to our citizens to be calm and to be sensitive and to respect the rights and the uh, privileges of all of our citizens, both constitutional rights and, and uh, cultural rights, and uh, to uh, maintain a harmonious state within the region. and. Uh, and I also repeated that message as I moved through the region in September, October, November, and uh, spoke to many, many groups. And uh, I was very, very pleased with uh, the compliance generally of the citizens of Peel. We had really no issues of any major significance. And uh, it just showed me the class and the, uh, the great dignity, for the most part, that all of our citizens have. Of course, and many of our citizens are your admirers. But I know in your line of work, sometimes you may make enemies. So oh, yes. does that mm -hmm. make you fear your own safety? 
Well, not really fear my own safety, but at times, um, you know, we are a very large organization. We're the third, third largest uh, municipal police organization in Canada. Uh, when you have the hundreds of thousands of issues that we get involved with and individuals that we get involved with uh, throughout a calendar year, uh, undoubtedly there's going to be issues. And generally, that as the process works, it will evolve through the chain of command and finally rest with the chief. So on occasion, uh, there are individuals that may not be the totally uh, pleased with a particular decision or determination that I make. But uh, so those, those sort of issues, when they arise, you deal with them uh, incident by incident. And my staff uh, look after those very quickly. So, so you're not afraid? I'm not concerned at all. No, that's, that's part of my job. and. Uh, I really don't uh, get too concerned about that. And uh, your family's safety, I imagine you're sure that they're safe as well? Yes, very cognizant of that and uh, I'm very pleased that that's not uh, really an issue here in this region. You've implemented a lot of new programs here, street crime prevention, yes. other youth programs and a number of others. You're a real doer. Uh, I try to, yeah. Is this something you were born with or was it taught at a young age? Um, I think it's a combination of both. I really, um, I really don't like uh, to remain static. I like to continually be looking uh, not only uh, continent-wide but internationally. I continue to try to look for programs that, that we can uh, perhaps totally or partially look at and integrate and apply here in Peel Region. And uh, I have a, a passionate commitment to youth, to children. Uh, so you're seniors. born that way then? I think so, yeah. probably, yeah, and our seniors uh, and uh, people that are challenged with various uh, uh, physical limitations. Uh, I think those that are disadvantaged and, uh, and uh, vulnerable probably are groups that I, that I uh, am concerned about a little bit more. But um, um, I was really pleased to be able to put in our community programs such as our, our bike unit and our school liaison program and the drug ed program into our schools to work with our children and, uh, and the uh, educational staff here in the region who are great. Our Peel Board and Dufferin Separate Board, uh, they're wonderful people to work with and, uh, and uh, probably in recent years the internet safety program. Pornography and victimization of children through the internet was something that always really concerned me and I was something I wanted to put into place and again the Police Services Board and Regional Council supported me on that without hesitation and uh, in fact um, several of our council members have been on the committee since we first broached the subject and uh, now the Peel Region Internet Safety Program has been rec replicated in several places across the country and in the United States and in fact, I've had contact as far away as uh, London, England, and Australia recently, so and South Africa as well. So I'm very pleased about that, so that we can give back to other communities across the nation, across the world. I learned a great deal through listening, and never make a major decision in life unless you get counsel, and counsel from different sources. Don't be too quick to make decisions, major decisions especially. Seek out as much advice as you can. Uh, fine wine takes time. If it's a major decision, uh, think about it. Research it as far as, as much as you possibly can and access and uh, don't be too quick to make a career decision in terms of leaving or in terms of where you want to go in the organization. I think for my own purposes, I was just very fortunate to know where I wanted to go, but when you enter the organization, there's a broad range of positions that you can apply for and, and look into and give it time, you know, give it exposure and uh, talk to the staff that are there, whether it's training, whether it's uh, criminal identification, whether it's uh, homicide, whether it's frauds. Learn as much as you can about it. Get exposed a little bit to it. And, uh, and always remember that uh, never forget where you came from. Don't let the uniform change you. There are instances in the past, and I'm sure in police organizations through, throughout the province and the country, where some men and women haven't been able to handle 
that additional authority and responsibility, never abuse it. And uh, as I frequently say to my recruit officers, uh, because it's part of the my philosophy of life, uh, I believe that every person I've ever encountered, I've tried to treat them the same. And 94 to 96 percent of the people you meet will treat you with deference and with respect uh, as long as you reciprocate. The other 4 percent we're trained uh, how to handle them. And uh, we will deal with them in the manner that they deal with us. And uh, that's not a problem for me. But I don't care whether someone arrived yesterday and has $10 in their pocket or whether they've been here for 30 years. And you know them and I know them. Your cameraman knows them. And they're a multimillionaire in this region. They have all sorts of assets. That doesn't impress me. I treat them both the same.